to unlock the, the God-given power that you have inside of you, right? That there's something inside of us that God is constantly striving to unlock as his sons and daughters. It says the whole world in Scripture is groaning and crying out for the sons and daughters of God to be realized, right? That the world groans and waits in, in, in anticipation for you and I to know who we were created to be, Amen. And when we know who we're created to be, we're able to operate with power and authority. And when we operate with power and authority, our prayers actually happen, right? That what we pray for actually comes about. That the Lord says, you were not given a spirit of timidity, but you were given a spirit of power, right? And you were given a spirit of love, right? That you weren't given a spirit of timidity, but we were, we were given a spirit of power and love. And when we understand that the Holy Spirit dwells in us and we have this power and this love that lives in us, it allows us to rise up as intercessors. Amen? I, I love this session because it just like there's nothing better when like we just anger the devil. And, and like I believe this session just angers the devil because he, he, he has tricked us to be small-minded Catholics, the pray without power. He has tricked us to be small-minded Catholics to pray without expectation and anticipation, right? So often we, we, we look to the mountain and the Lord says, say to that mountain, get up and move. And instead we look at that mountain and we say, it can't be moved. And this session is meant to change that, to lift that off of your mind so that you would pray with power and authority. You would pray with faith and you would look to the mountain and you wouldn't see a mountain, but you would see a molehill in the eyes of God. Why? Because when you look up at a mountain, it looks big to you, but you're not the one who's moving it. The Father in heaven looks down and that mountain is so tiny and he's the one who's doing the movement. You see, you've been looking from your perspective and God says, stop looking from your perspective. You've been praying from your perspective. And God says, stop praying from your perspective. Stop praying looking at the mountain that is higher than you and start praying from heavenly places looking from my divine perspective to see what I can do. Amen? Guys, we have a God who has promised power. He has promised to move things. These, this is just, these are the promises of God. Ask and you will receive. Knock and and the door will be opened. Seek and you will find. The promise of God is this. He says, if you remain in me, whatever you ask in my name, I will give you. If you remain in me, if you remain in me, whatever, not some things, whatever you ask of me, I will give you. I love this. This is the Lord. He says, Isaiah 30, verse 19, he says, people of Zion, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. How gracious God will be when you cry for help. When you cry out in intercession, when you pray for God's help and providence, he will be so gracious to you. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. God hears you. God hears your prayers, and when we know that God hears us, and when we know that God has the same urgency on his heart that we have on our heart, we have faith. That when we know that God hears, it builds faith in me. When I know that God has urgency to not only hear my prayers, but to deliver my prayers, it fills us with faith. O oh, people of Zion, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Is the word of God living and active or is the word of God dead? I think it's alive, right? Is the word of God truth or false? It's truth. So the Lord has made a promise. The question is, have you come into agreement with that promise? Do you believe in the God who makes promises? You see, brothers and sisters, the Lord wants to increase our faith. And prayer was meant to be the vehicle by which God would renew the world. Prayer was meant to be the primary means to crush the head of the serpent and to advance the kingdom of God. 
And the reason we're not seeing more fruit in the kingdom, and the reason we're seeing a decline in the church and not a growth in the church, I believe is because the people of God aren't praying enough. We're not praying with faith, and we're not crying out to God. We're working so hard, and we've got so many laborers in the vineyard of the Lord, and they're tired, and they're burnt out, and they're working long hours. But I, I truly wonder, what's more valuable, 10,000 church employees who are working pat, like overtime and are burnt out and tired, or 10 cloistered Carmelites who are on their knees crying out to God for transformation? I know it's the 10 cloistered Carmelites, and the reason I know that is because you see over and over and over again in the Old Testament that the Lord, he doesn't need a giant army to bring victory. Actually, sometimes when he saw a giant army and the Israelites, if they didn't have the right disposition of heart, he would tell the general, get rid of some of them. And he would shrink the army so that the army would fight not with their own force of human power, but they would fight with faith. Brothers and sisters, I want us to be an army. And if you think about bringing revival to the entire Catholic church in the world, like Sam talked about, you may say, well, Dan, it's impossible for 250 missionaries to bring revival to the entire world. I bet actually some of you, when you heard Sam say our vision is to bring revival to the, wor the church in the world, you were like, hmm, that's cute, but that's impossible. You see, the Lord doesn't need an army of 250 million to transform the world. The Lord needs men and women who are on their knees and who have faith. He needs people whose hearts know that revival doesn't come from human activity, but divine activity. You see, revival isn't our camp. Our camps won't bring revival because camp doesn't come from worldly activity. Revival only comes from above. And that's why you have so many amazing ministries happening and people with good hearts and pure intentions laboring in the vineyard of the Lord, but they're not seeing conversion. It's because revival doesn't come from my human activity. It only comes from above. There is nothing I can do. My voice inflections, my passion, my preparation, and my notes can't change your heart. The only thing that can change your heart is that the Holy Spirit would move while I preach and would change your heart. Dan in this equation is nothing. You in this equation of revival is nothing. It's all God. And the more we surrender to him in prayer and we cry out to the Father of creation to change our campers' lives, to change our church, to renew our parishes, to renew our churches again, then we'll see revival. Brothers and sisters, I work like crazy. I wake up every morning and go to bed every night working hard. So it's not that we don't work and we're not faithful to what God has asked us to do, but we must know that revival comes from above. Amen? We see this in the Old Testament over and over again. Joseph mentioned on the first night of Equip that in the Old Testament, David, whenever he would restore the full-time worshipers, there would be revival. And David's kingdom was the greatest kingdom in Israelite history. And what David did was he had 4,000 full-time worshipers. And he had 4,000 full-time intercessors. And when, when Israel would start to fall, whenever seven times in Israel's history, we see this, seven times when they restored the full-time worship ministry and when they restored the full-time intercession ministry, they saw revival. A few years back, we believed so much in this, we started our service staff. Let's give it up for our service staff. Did you know... Our service staff and the kitchen staff are meant to be our full-time intercessors. That their ministry primarily is a ministry of intercession. That's why they're here this summer. I'm happy to say this is the first time ever in CYSC history we have a full-time worship staff. Amen? We have given pride and place in this community to worship and intercession. Why? Because we believe that we have to minister to God and that we have to depend on God. Guys, it's everything. It's everything. 
And it, it, it requires more resources of people. It requires more resources of time. But we see seven times in Israel's history when they restore full-time intercessors and full-time um, worshipers, revival comes. Revival will not come without worship and intercession. This is what it says in uh, Isaiah 62. I have, poured, I have posted watchmen. That's the intercessors. I have posted watchmen on the walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. What should the disposition of an intercessor be? It's one who establishes themselves on the wall, defending Jerusalem, looking outward at the attacks of the enemy, and then on the wall, looking inward of the needs of Jerusalem. You're established to see the assault of the enemy. You're established to see the needs of the people in the church, in the, in the walls, and you, you will not be silent day or night. Intercessors are not ones who give one little prayer and move on. Intercessors are ones who are not silent day or night. They cry out, you who will call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. Intercession isn't for the lazy. Intercession isn't for the complacent. Interse That's why we're not seeing revival in the church. Because we're a complacent, apathetic, lazy church. And when we actually realize that to be a worshiper and to be an intercessor means that I have to put in effort in my prayer, we'll start seeing transformation. The liturgy is called a liturgy for a reason. It goes to the Greek word that means the work of the people. Mass isn't supposed to be the lazy session of the people. It's our work. Prayer is labor. Prayer is work. It's liturgy. It's the work on behalf of the people. We will have no rest, but we'll be intercessors. And then it says, and give God no rest. Don't stop crying out until, until he establishes Jerusalem, the church. Until he establishes the people of God and makes her the, play, the praise of the earth. Wouldn't it be beautiful for the church to be the praise of the earth again? For the world to look at us not as judgmental cynics, but to see us as the praise of the earth. Revival doesn't come without intercessors. Guys, intercessions, ch intercession changes nations. Here's the deal. The last three years I've been prophesying that we are in the abortion red zone. That we are literally in the 20-yard line moving towards the goalpost, right? And, and that abortion, Roe v. Wade, is so close to being overturned. Brothers and sisters, Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned this summer in Jesus' name. It will be. We're going to see possibly on Sunday, I mean on Friday, I'm guessing Friday, 459, boom, the Supreme Court's going to overturn Roe v. Wade. The, the brothers and sisters, we're on the one yard line. We're about to see victory. And that victory has been purchased at a price. It's been purchased at the price of 50 years since 1973. Men and women going to prison over their intercession for the end of abortion. Men and women on their knees walking at abortion clinics, praying the rosary day after day after day. We have seen a church that is united, Protestant and Catholic, in one heart, in one mind, in agreement to overturn Roe v. Wade in this nation. We're going to see this in our lifetime because of the faithfulness of intercession. If you want to be a part of something that shifts our nation, get on your knees. If you want to be a part of something that's going to actually bear fruit, not just in eternity, but also here on earth, get on your knees. We're going to see victory. Someone said, man, I can't wait till Roe v. Wade's overturned because then we can end the march for life. And that's like, okay, that's awesome. Let's stop the March for Life, but then let's start the March for Marriage and start intercessing for something else because God wants us to win this nation. Amen? Jesus was clear with that he wants, he wants us to be a people who are intercessors. He wants to raise up a generation, an army, who believes so much in his might that they would sacrifice greatly for him. So what is intercession? It's not a unique gift or a spiritual office for only some, but it's, a, it's something we're all called to. It's rooted in our baptism, that you are priest, prophet, and king. And as a priest, you are called to be an intercessor. And as a prophet and a king, you find the power and the authority to be an intercessor. Right, in first, um, 
Peter chapter 2, it says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a royal priesthood. The priesthood represents sacrifice. The royalty represents power and authority. Did you know that your power and your authority comes from your sacrifice? We are a royal priesthood, but that power, the kingly anointing, is only released when we are first priest. And who are the priests? In the Old Testament, the priests are the ones who offer sacrifice in the temple to reconcile God and man. And that's what an intercessor is, is one who offers sacrifice in this temple, in the temple of the Holy Spirit, one who offers sacrifice for the sake of the people to reconcile God and man. That if you want to be a priest, you're called to be an intercessor. You see, intercession requires sacrifice. A sacrifice of time that I'm going to dedicate time to prayer. A sacrifice of energy that I'm actually going to work in this time of prayer. That I'm not just going to be lazy. A sacrifice of maybe my human comfort. That I'm going to fast and give something up. A sacrifice of the heart. That maybe I've been suffering and I offer my suffering up in union with Jesus on the cross for the salvation of souls. The brothers, we are called to offer sacrifice in our temple. Jesus made us a kingdom of priests. And as a kingdom of priests, we are called to sacrifice together. You see, the church was meant to be a kingdom of intercessors. And the early church knew this, and they established ourselves as this. Did you know that Mass is primarily an intercessory prayer? It's a prayer of great worship to the Father, but it's the sacrifice, the priestly sacrifice of Jesus offered to the Father. The Mass is a, 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 a priestly offering, a sacrificial, intercessory offering back to the Father. The holy sacrifice of the Mass makes present again the sacrifice of Jesus. It makes the grace, the power, and the authority of the greatest act of sacrifice present here on earth. So the mass is the greatest intercessory prayer. I ask you, how many masses have you wasted? You see, when you go to mass, you can offer mass up for someone or for something. Have you done that? Yesterday, we offered the mass up for our new bishop, Bishop Earl Fernandez at 4.30. Yeah. I think we were probably the first community in the Diocese of Columbus to offer Mass for the newly ordained Bishop Earl because we actually offered that Mass while the ordination was still happening, right? Which is pretty cool. Don't waste a Mass this summer. The priest brings one offering uh, 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 to the table, but you get to bring an offering too. If your campers are struggling, bring that to the Mass. If your family is struggling, bring that to the Mass. Don't waste a a mass. The church is an intercession machine, right? Every Sunday, it should be a global day of prayer where 1.2 million Catholics are interceding. Imagine if every Sunday, we, 1.2 million people uh, came together, 1.2 billion Catholics, I'm sorry, came together in prayer for one thing. Then we'd see power. Then we'd see power. There's prayers of the faithful at mass, Are we attentive? We stand during the prayers of the faithful to be attentive so that it's an action in our work. The liturgy of the hours, which is the mass continued, is an intercessory prayer. There's daily, hourly intercession going on. Why? Because the church wants to make sure at every moment we are worshiping and we are interceding. That the church has established herself as a priestly people. Let's participate. We have the the season of Lent. I remember one time I was at a conference, and they were advertising, as a Protestant conference, and they were advertising this 40-day of prayer and fasting for the conversion of the world. And I went home. I was like, man, Amber, this is so awesome. This Protestant church, they have a global community that's doing a 40-day global fast for the conversion of the world. And and she's like, Dan, that's called Lent, right? (laughs) But the reason I don't know that's what Lent is is because we don't enter into Lent with an intercessory heart. We enter into Lent like, hmm, maybe I'll lose a few pounds this Lenten season, right? Brothers and sisters, repent. Your fasting is not for your weight loss. Your fasting is for the salvation of mankind. 
Do you fast? You know, when I enter into Lent, and I'm more concerned about the sacrifice than I am about that, what I'm sacrificing for, Lent's miserable. Fasting is so hard when you don't have an intention. If you just are like, I'm going to start fasting, and there's no intention behind your fasting, there's no power there. And so you're trying to fast with human effort as opposed to divine power. But when you are fasting for the conversion of a loved one, or when you're fasting for the end of abortion, or when you're fasting for the conversion of a nation, what happens is you have divine power to exercise that fast, and the fast actually becomes easy. Be a priesthood, a people of sacrifice. The rosary, amen? Amen. Dude, I love Gabe Gessler. That dude's insane. He's like so often, he's just like, like walking around with the rosaries in his hand. I'm like, man, how many does he say a day, right? Guys, Padre Pio said it, the rosary is the weapon. It's where the power comes. If you're like, man, I want to be an intercessor, but I don't know where to start. Boom, I got, I got a happy little prayer called the rosary. That's where you can start. My favorite intercessory prayer is the Chapel of Divine Mercy. There's so much power in the chapel of divine mercy. Jesus told um, St. Faustina that he could not deny a soul at the moment of their death if the chaplet was being prayed for them. It is the instrument of salvation. If you desire to pray for the conversion, I love every decade to offer the chapel of divine mercy up for something else. First decade, boom, I'm going for China. Second day, boom, I'm going for Africa. Third decade, boom, I'm going for South America. Fourth decade, boom, I'm going for my family. Like, that we want to offer, we want to use these decades of the, the chapel of divine mercy for the conversion of the world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on me and on the whole world. Every prayer of the chapel of divine mercy is a prayer for God's mercy to bring conversion to the nations. Amen? Amen. Intercession requires sacrifice. The priest offers sacrifice. So how do we do this at camp? You know, at camp it's a little hard because um, we don't want to sacrifice too much from our food at camp because uh, we want to model healthy eating habits to campers, especially middle schoolers and high school women who maybe, and men who are going through a lot of body image issues. We don't want to avoid food during camp. Also, we want to take care of our bodies during camp because we're pouring our bodies out in a very physical way. So you can fast from simple things like, hey, I'm not going to eat desserts during the summer. I'm not going to drink coffee during the summer. Uh, I, 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 like, so I know, I know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So, sounds, like, sounds like a lot of grace could be unlocked in this place. Yeah. Uh, but so we can fast from simple things like that, but I encourage you to look for other ways to fast, right? That you offer Mealtime competitions up as a fast that you may be like, man, I don't want to do mealtime competition right now. Guess what? It's not about you, right? And so if you don't want to do mealtime competition, offer that up in union with the heart of Jesus for the salvation of your campers. And all of a sudden that whiny moment has become a prayer of power. At camp, what we like to do is we like to have specific times of intercession. Program staff will do intercession before club. Counseling staff has times of intercession together. Uh, Service staff and kitchen staff, worship staff, we all have times. Media staff, times of dedicated intercession. And as we we have times of intercession, what we want to do in those times of intercession, guess what intercession isn't? It's not contemplation. Contemplation's a good thing, but we're not like, hmm. Resting in God during intercession. Intercession is an active vocal prayer. So the whole body actively enters into prayer together in a vocal manner. And so we want to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice during that time. And as we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice for that time, we also want to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice in agreement with one attention. Because there's power in numbers. And so when the children of God come together in agreement, the Father wants to listen. Right? Like, there's nothing worse than, like, when uh, I'm like, okay, kids, what do you want to do tonight? And, like, Gemma wants to eat at McDonald's. And Sophia wants Wendy's. And Giovanni wants Chipotle. And Liliana wants, like, mac and cheese. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh, crap. Like, what do I do? Right? But when there's agreement, and that just makes me frustrated. I'm like, what's going on? When there's agreement, when everyone's like, let's do this. Amber and I are like, all right, let's do this, right? When the children of God come together in agreement, it softens the heart of God 
to get behind their desire. It's amazing that when my kids cry out for something together, it softens my heart to want that as well. And you actually see in the Old Testament a God whose heart is filled with just righteous anger, and yet it becomes softened when his people cry out to him. So we want to actually get behind uh, an agreement for something. We're going to pray right now for the conversion of our campers together. We're going to pray for their families together. We're going to pray for the transformation of their schools together, for the renewal of their parishes together. And at Damascus, we have a special heart for campers. We have a special heart for their families. We have a special heart for their schools, and we have a special heart for their parishes. Right, So we want to make sure that as we position ourselves, we're getting behind those acts of intercession. When we do this, we want to have moments of intercession, but we also want to live a lifestyle of intercession. So God doesn't tell us to pray as sometimes. St. Paul says, pray without ceasing. And because we pray, and you're like, how do I pray without ceasing? It's as you're going through your day, and you're like, man, I wish my campers knew you more, Lord. And you just cry out to them for that. Man, I wish they, they understood how loved they were. Lord, allow them to know how lo- loved they are. Cry out. When you get tired, Lord, re- I offer this sacrifice up for the conversion of my campers. That make your entire day, your every sacrifice, your every annoyance, everything to be his. Sometimes I like to put a little tiny pebble, not a big pebble, a little pebble in your shoe just to remind you all day of this annoyance in your foot. And every step you take, it reminds you, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, and you're walking in prayer with him to remind you of that simple little fast, that there's a painful annoyance in my foot, and yet I can turn my heart to God in prayer in that moment. That's how we want to we wanna have a, um, a heart of intercession before, minis- uh, before meetings, before activities, not just moments of prayer, but the heart, right, that it would go into it. What are some visions of intercession in the, in the scriptures? We see a wall. The, the, the intercessor is one who is a wall between the, the people of God and the assault of the enemy. As an intercessor, you should see yourself as a powerful warrior in God's kingdom. And you're protecting the people of God. And we're so lucky because we get to work with the children of God. And we're protecting them from the enemy's assault. Imagine if this campus was flanked with 250 intercessors. And when the children of God came and all the demons that are attached to them, anxiety, depression, self-harm, self-hatred, anger, bitterness, if those demons who were trying to get into our campus, if we were the wall, the barrier around this place that said, guess what? You're not welcomed here. And that as those campers come onto our campus, it would actually fall off of them. Freedom doesn't come from Brad giving a talk. Freedom doesn't come from Joseph leading a song. Freedom doesn't come from us dancing really like excitedly. Freedom comes when the people of God cast out evil spirits in Jesus' name. And when we are a wall that stands between the devil's assault and God's children, we can actually allow his children to experience freedom before they even get here. That's why we intercede before camp. Because we want God's children, we intercession is preparing the soil. It's preparing the soil so that when we throw the word of God in that soil, the rocky ground isn't there anymore and the thorns aren't there anymore. The soil has been prepared, amen? Another one we see is a standing in the gap. Standing in the gap. In the Old Testament, the intercessor is one who stands in the gap. Jesus stands in the gap. Brad talked about that chasm between uh, God and man. And Jesus, the true intercessor, positioned himself as the bridge for the people of God to be reunited to God. You stand in the gap as the one who bridges the people of God who have fallen away to a God who wants his children back. This is what we see in Ezekiel chapter 22. The Lord says, I sought for anyone, anyone among them who would repair the wall and would stand in the gap before me. He said, I sought for anyone who would be my intercessors on behalf of the land so that I would not destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their conduct upon their heads, says the Lord. You think the Lord wants our world to suffer right now? 
You think the world, you think he wants to see what's happening in Russia and the Ukraine. You think he wants to, to see the, the dismantling of the church in Europe. He's crying out. But his plan for revival wasn't that he would fix everything. A good dad doesn't fix all their children's problems. A good dad empowers the children to do what is right. So he's like, come on. I'm just waiting for anyone who will cry out. Anyone who will ask for me so that I can bring victory again. Jesus Christ has won the victory. We have to cry out that that victory would be released. He's, he doesn't want to destroy, brothers and sisters. He doesn't want to destroy. He wants intercessors like Abraham who fought so the Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't destroyed. He wants intercessors like Moses who fought that God wouldn't destroy the people of Israel when they were worshiping false idols. He wants intercessors like Elijah I love Elijah. This comes from 1 Kings. And everyone loves, we love as charismatics when the fire comes down from heaven and consumes everything, right? When after that happens, immediately after, the reason God positioned Isaiah was because there was a drought in the land. I mean, Elijah. And God wanted to end the drought. There's a drought in our lands across the whole world right now. And God wants to end it. He wants the people to drink again. And Elijah, he brings fire down from heaven, and the people repent and return to God. And then this is to end the drought. This is what it says. Elijah says to Ahab, get up and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. Side note, there was not the sound of heavy rain. Elijah had faith to prophesy what God was going to do. He said, get, go and eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went to eat and drink, and while Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, he crouched down to the earth, and he put his head between his knees. Climb up and look out to the sea, he directed his servant, who went up and looked, but it reported, there is nothing. Seven times he said, go look again, and the seventh time the youth reported, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising from the sea. Elijah said, go say to Ahab, harness up and leave the mountain before the rain stops you. In a thrice, the sky grew dark with clouds and wind and a heavy rain fell. Ahab mounted his chariot and made for the, for the, for the valley. Brothers and sisters, seven times. Elijah knew what God wanted to do, and he prayed with faith. And when he prayed the first time, the rain didn't come. So he prayed a second time, and the rain didn't come. He prayed a third time, the rain didn't come. He prayed a fourth time, the rain didn't come. Whoa, is, is he starting to doubt? No, he has faith in what God will do. He prays a fourth, fifth time, and a sixth time. And the seventh time, does the storm come? No, even the seventh time, the storm doesn't come. But what does he see? He small, sees a small rain cloud the size of a fist. And, and that was the sign he needed to increase his faith and to say, more is coming. You see, sometimes we cry out and we don't get anything. So we stop crying out. The Lord says, no, cry out again. 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 And then the Lord, as you're crying out again, he doesn't answer your prayer fully all at once. For 50 years, we've been crying out for the end of abortion. And we saw these small rain clouds over the time. Why? Because, oh, wow, this abortion clinic was shut down because of prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for that small rain cloud. We know the flood's coming. You see, when you see the small things God does, you have expectation that God will do greater things. The intercessor doesn't just wait for the power and the storm and the victory. The intercessor gives worship and increases the intercession when the Lord provides small providence. Amen? You see, revival hasn't happened yet through the work of our hands, but we're seeing small rain clouds. So we pray with great expectation that God is going to bring more and more and more. Amen? Amen. Elijah was a prophet. Intercession is about priestly anointing and the prophetic anointing. The prophet sees what God wants to do and prays that God would do it. Elijah was able to pray for the storms to come because his heart was in union with God's heart. When your heart is in union with the Father's heart, you know the Father's desire. So you're praying for the Father to give what he desires, right? If, if my kids are like, Daddy, can we go get ice cream? You know 100% of the time I'm like, yes, because my heart desires ice cream, right? If, if the kids are like, 
mommy, can we have vegetables? 100% of the time, mom's like, yes, right? When our hearts are united with God's heart, we can get an agreement with what God wants. Amen? Amen. This is what uh, a, a, a Protestant pastor, Walter Williams, he says, intercession is spiritual defiance of what is in the name of what God has promised. Intercession visualizes an alternative future to the one apparently fated by contradictory forces. It infuses the air of a time yet to be into the suffocating atmosphere of the present. History belongs to the intercessors. You know, in 2020, there was a global lockdown. And there was something in my heart and in our staff's heart and in our missionaries' heart that God wanted camp to happen. Did you know on June 3rd of 2020, this is June 2nd, I believe, or June 1st, June 1st, on June 3rd of 2020, camps still were not allowed to operate in the state of Ohio, and yet we were running equipped. And we had decided we're bringing all the missionaries in, and we're going to equip them for the work of ministry, and we're going to pray with expectancy that God will change governmental orders to allow us to have permission to open camp. Do you know, literally, after we did the intercession session that day on June 3rd at, at 11 a.m., did you know that literally four hours later, the government released a report the summer camps were allowed to open? <laughs> Brothers and sisters... When your heart is united to the Father's heart, things happen. When a community gathers together and prays for one thing in agreement, things happen. God wants us to be so consumed with praying in agreement for God to move. He wants us to go after his heart, to know his desires, and to pursue his desires. We can be prophets in our intercession. We can be kings in our intercession. First John chapter 4 says, He is in, who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Second Corinthians, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. There, there are campers who will come this summer who have strongholds in their life. And, and you'll look at them and you'll be like, wow, your life is just so broken. Your family's broken. And, and, and some, the way they talk, sometimes everything that comes out of their mouth is negativity. It's a stronghold of negativity. It's a stronghold of the culture of death. And, and guess what? You have divine power to demolish that stronghold. You, you have divine power to demolish that stronghold. We must pray with power. The Lord says that the prayers of the righteous are strong and efficacious. That means the prayers of the righteous are not only strong, but what they pray actually comes about. Your prayers are powerful, amen? The evil one wants to stop you. My heart was so changed one day we were at a prayer meeting and we were praying the prayers of, um, of, of St. Michael. I know I've shared this before, but for those who haven't heard, as we prayed the prayer of St. Michael, just this idea of us praying, uh, uh, we speak of Satan, and we're like, he's one who's prowling about the world, seeking the ruin and destruction of souls. And I realize that so much of the church has positioned herself as the prey. And, and, and the devil is this predator, and we've made him a lion and a dragon, and us wimpy, pathetic, like, prey. And we're like, oh no, the devil's prowling about the world, seeking the ruin and destruction of us. And we, he's so strong and he's so powerful. And something happened in me where it was like a renewal of the mind, where my mindset shifted. That no longer are we the prey. No longer will we live with the prey mentality where the devil is prowling about seeking our ruin and destruction. But we, as sons and daughters of God, will rise up with the lion of Judah as the king and the kings, and we will be the predator and we will destroy the works of satan you brothers and sisters should prowl about the world seeking the ruin and destruction of all the evil ones all the evil spirits you the devil has an assignment against you and against your campers guess what in the name of jesus he has redeemed you with the assignment against the devil that you now have an assignment to destroy his works and to destroy the works of the enemy amen all right, why do I love intercession so much? Intercession is the only missionary activity that still happens in heaven. Did you know that? Intercession is the missionary work of heaven. 
that in heaven you see the angels and the saints doing two things, harp and bowl, worship and intercession. And so if you have the heart of a missionary, I don't get to be a missionary in the same way in heaven unless I'm an intercessor. St. Therese of Lisieux, she's the patroness of missionaries. She was a cloistered nun, and the reason she's the patroness of missionaries was because she had a missionary heart, and that missionary heart was a heart of intercession, and she cried out day and night for the nations, and and God honored that heart, and when she got to heaven, the Lord said, I'm answering your prayer now. You're going to be a heavenly intercessor, and you will literally shift the nations. St. Therese probably ministered to like less people than I ministered to here on earth, in her life, far less than I have. But she has literally ministered to millions and millions and millions of people throughout this world because of her missionary heart and her intercessory prayer of heaven. God wants to use your heart of intercession to to unlock heavenly treasures. All right, I gotta close. There's three things we wanna do. Three reasons intercession is critical. Number one, God's giving is inseparably connected to our asking. The Lord said, ask and you shall receive. He did not say, if you don't ask, I'll pour it out. Ask, and you shall receive. Pentecost was the result of an ask. We have to ask. Acts 12, James died, Peter was in prison, and it says the church gathered together and they prayed for Peter to be released. And God released Peter from prison. Gabe's dad Gabe's dad last summer was literally dying. And and, and as he gives testimony himself, was probably crossing over to death and had died. And the Lord brought him back to life. There was a time in Gabe's dad's life where the doctor said he was gone. The intercessory prayer of our missionaries last summer raised him from the dead. Brothers and sisters, Your prayer is powerful. When we agree on something and we come together in prayer, we can change lives. Amen? God hears you. And he wants us to have persistence in our prayer. He wants us to cry out with persistence. Number two, the second reason we have to pray. Intercession is the very means by which we fulfill the Great Commission. The Lord ordered us. He mandated all of his disciples to take the gospel to nations. It is literally impossible for me to take the gospels to nations when I am called to minister in Centerburg, Ohio. And so how do I possibly fulfill the Great Commission? The means by which I fulfill the Great Commission and take the gospel to the nations is not simply by me traveling all the time all over the world. I'm a missionary in China. I truly believe I am because I pray for China every single day. I, I, I want to see the demise and the destruction of communism because I think it's the greatest demonic stronghold in this world. So I pray and I intercede for China daily. I pray and I intercede for the Muslims every single day because I am not okay with the, the, the rapid growth of the Muslim uh, faith, a faith that does not know the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. Brothers, Jesus said, it is through him that all are saved. And so we need to proclaim the name of Jesus We can be missionaries to the nations here in Centerburg. You can be a missionary to your family even while you're at camp. If you're if you're hard, if you're having a hard time, like man, I, I I I my heart is for my family this summer. Awesome, your heart's for your family this summer because you're meant to be an intercessor for them. So allow that to actually impact you, right? If you want to see the Muslims change, then be an intercessor. If you want to pray for, we're going to be talking about persecuted church uh, and and the persecution that's happening in Christians all over the world this summer for our service project, be an intercessor for that. Pray for the end of the drug cartels in South America. Get get behind the homelessness in your city and your state. Be an intercessor that is here in every strata. Be an intercessor for your university this summer. Why? So you can prepare the soil so that when you get back on campus, the campus is already ready for revival. Revival doesn't start when the school year starts. Revival starts when you start praying for it, right? So get on your knees and let's pray. Lastly, intercession gives you the heart of God for his people. David was the greatest king because before David was a king, he was a shepherd. And I'm convinced that in order to be an effective king that operates with power and authority, you have to have the heart of a shepherd who loves the sheep. When we have the heart of the good shepherd and when we love the sheep so much, 
And we understand just what God meant when he said, man, I don't want to lose even one of them. I don't want one lost sheep. Brothers and sisters, how, how troubled are you with those who don't know Jesus? Intercession gives us the heart of the Father for his people. It allows us to love like God and to live like God. Love compels us to pray. Love compels us to pray. Did you know what the secret of unlocking the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in your life? The secret to unlocking the gifts of the Holy Spirit is not a powerful prayer time. Because you could go to a powerful prayer time and nothing happened. The secret of unlocking the charisms, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in your life, ironically, it's not even acts of devotion and personal holiness. That you can have the gifts of the Holy Spirit without personally being holy. The secret to unlocking the charisms, because they're gifts for the sake of others, is a heart of love. That when my heart genuinely desires God's gifts to be on his people, God gives me the power to release those gifts on his people. When you have a heart of love for his people, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are the ammunition, the tools, and the resources that are poured out to fulfill that desire. You see, the charisms and the gifts of the Holy Spirit aren't for you, and they're not for you to feel awesome about yourself. And so if our prayer time is all about me, and it's not all about them, then all of a sudden, maybe the gifts of the Holy Spirit won't be poured out on me. But if I'm hungry in my prayer time, not only for personal sanctification, but that the world would know him, the Lord's going to see that heart and he's going to pour out his gifts on you. We have a church that needs you, a people who are starving, a people who are hungry, and they don't even know what they're hungry for. So I just want to pray here at the end. We're just going to close and we're going to ask for God's heart to fall on us. And like I said, it's not, there's nothing I can do to to break your heart for his people. It's a gift. And I think what God wants to do in your heart right now is he wants wants to give you a greater gift of compassion. When Jesus saw the crowds over and over again in the Gospels, it says his heart was moved with compassion. That word means to suffer with. The Lord wants to move our heart with compassion. He wants to move our heart with compassion for the nations. He wants to move our heart with compassion for the poor and for the suffering. He wants to move our heart with compassion for those who don't know him, for our family and for our campers. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would give us the Father's heart We pray that you would give us Jesus' most sacred heart. We pray you would allow our hearts to be broken over the things that break your heart, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would let us live with sensitivity to the Spirit. That we wouldn't grow in the apathy of this world or the complacency to evil, but that our hearts would be resensitized to sin, resensitized to the strongholds on our culture. Fill us with compassion right now in Jesus' name. Move, Lord, move. Break our hearts over the things that break yours, Lord. Not even one would go unknown. That not even one would not be saved. First, we're just going to pray for our missionary body, that we would know his heart, that we would have his heart, that we'd be an intercessory army that is filled with the heart of God. Let it break mine, let it break mine. Anything that breaks your heart, let it break mine, let it break mine. Anything that breaks your heart, let it break mine. Let it break 
breaks your heart. Let it break mine. Let it break mine. Breaks your heart. Let it break mine. Let it break mine. Your heart. Let it break mine. Let it break mine. We're going to pray for our campers today, that they would experience the power and the grace of Jesus Christ like never before. I pray for a baptism of the Holy Spirit to fall over every camper this summer. The strongholds would be broken in Jesus' name, and the sons and daughters of God would come alive, come alive, that the death would come to life. I pray that these sons and daughters would not simply be receivers of the word, but they would be carriers of the word, that we would form not just disciples, but that we would commission and anoint in Jesus' Jesus' name, missionaries for the nations. We pray for their families, brother. Oh, Lord, we just ask for everyone, every family of our campers to have powerful transformation this summer. That I pray that as we're ministering to the campers, that you would send angels and saints to minister in the homes. That we pray the hearts of moms and dads would be transformed. The families would return to the holy sacrifice of the mass. The families would become uh, missionary families, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray for their parishes and their schools. I want to see renewed parishes, Lord. You desire that the church would be alive again. I pray the power of God and the Holy Spirit to fall on all parishes in the Diocese of Columbus and throughout Ohio and through our nation, Lord. I pray for every camper's parish to see a renewal that was unexpected, unplanned, and unprogrammed. I pray for a new Pentecost on our parishes and our Catholic schools, that we would see renewal and transformation and this nation again, Lord. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we right, pray right now for our nation. We pray for all the demonic strongholds that are cap, like holding our people prisoner. Lord, we pray against all evil spirits in this nation right now in Jesus' name. We pray for the destruction of abortion. We pray for the destruction of human trafficking. We pray for the end of drugs and the opioid addictions, Lord. We pray for freedom to fall. We pray for the resurrection of the family unit, Lord, in this nation. We pray for fatherhood to be restored in this nation, Lord. We pray that you would bring life again, Lord, that we would not only be a nation that promotes economic freedom, but that we would become the, the land of the free, that we would be free in Jesus' name, that the Spirit of God would dwell here, that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there would be freedom, and that we would become known as a nation of worshipers, that we'd be known as a nation that has been reclaimed by Jesus Christ.
Lord, we pray for the nations of this world, especially for Muslim nations, that you would change them and baptize them in the Holy Spirit. I pray that Jesus, as you've been appearing to them in dreams and visions, that you would just continue to appear, that you would continue to appear. I pray that the name of Jesus would be proclaimed in every strata of human civilization, that those places that have not heard of your name before, Lord, that your name would be proclaimed. And those governments that don't allow the freedom of the gospel to be proclaimed, I pray for your spirit to destroy those governmental leaders' evil intentions, and that the gospel will be proclaimed in Korea, in China, and throughout all of Africa. We pray for the resurrection of the gospel, that the word of God would be preached on the streets. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just pray for any intention on your heart. Whatever causes you to weep this day and this moment, we pray for that. Lord, we can't see like you see. We don't see from your perspective in heaven. Lord, your heart is so broken over so many things that we just are completely ignorant of. There are so many people who are suffering. You just see every individual person right now who's in their bedroom that feels lost and in despair. You see every captive. You look down from the cross and you look down from heaven and you see the pain and the hurt and the misery of your children. And Lord, we just want to be a people who bring your children home. We want to be a people who bring this family of God back together. So God, whatever's on your heart, we want that to be on our heart this moment. Come, Holy Spirit. Come through Mary. Come, Holy Spirit. Come through Mary. Come, Holy Spirit. Come through Mary. Let's just close this time of prayer, just singing the Hail Mary again. And as we pray every night, this prayer during the summer, let's just entrust all of our campers. Let's entrust all their families, their parishes, their schools. Let's entrust this apostolate and this community of missionaries over to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come through Mary. Mary. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. When I say come Holy Spirit, you say come through Mary. Come Holy Spirit.